Hey, everybody, welcome to the Biz STL podcast. I'm your host, Mike Miller. The Biz STL podcast is where we meet with leaders from around St. Louis to learn more about how they built their businesses, what they see for the future of St. Louis's business scene, and how some of their greatest lessons just might serve as learning opportunities for your own career. This episode of the Biz STL podcast is sponsored by Jingle STL. Here in St. Louis, we're incredibly lucky to have a wealth of incredible, world-renowned restaurants in virtually every neighborhood across the region. Seriously, when it comes to dining out, St. Louis punches far, far above its weight. But why is that? The restaurant business is a notoriously challenging industry to succeed in. What are some of the business factors that make St. Louis such a seemingly friendly climate for restaurateurs seeking to take chances and wow diners? On today's episode, we chat with Tara Galina, one of the leaders behind Take Root Hospitality, which is one of the most successful and inventive restaurant groups in the region. Tara helps us understand what makes St. Louis's dining scene unique, some of the business strategies that go into building a popular restaurant concept, and even some of the industry trends she's following heading into 2025. All that and more to come on today's show. Hang tight. We'll be right back. Looking to elevate your company holiday celebrations? Book your festive party at Jingle STL. This winter wonderland located at Car Shield Field in O'Fallon, Missouri, is open for holiday parties from November 22nd to December 31st. With themed holiday suites for groups of every size and spectacular views of Jingle Village, it's the perfect spot for companies to celebrate together with cheer. Don't wait. Dates are filling fast. Book your suite today at jingleholiday.com slash book dash a dash party. All right, welcome back. Today's guest is Tara Galina, co-owner of Take Root Hospitality, which operates four restaurants around St. Louis, Vicia, Winslow's Table, Taqueria Marita, and Bistro La Florissant. For the record, I would say this even if you weren't sitting right across me right now, but Take Root Hospitality is one of the absolute powerhouse restaurant groups in the region. And don't just take my word for it. Earlier this year, Take Root received its second James Beard Award nomination in as many years for Outstanding Restaurateur, which is a national category recognizing some of the absolute best places to eat in the entire country. Tara, it's a real pleasure to have you here with us today. It's my pleasure, Mike. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, before we dive in, we like to start each episode with a round of rapid fire questions. I'll ask you a few quick questions just to get to know you just a little bit better beyond the uh, restaurant industry. Start with how do you start your day? How do you like to get going in the morning to uh, make sure you have a great, productive, good day? Yeah, so I I think I have a unique perspective because I have two very small children. So my day starts mostly about taking care of others and it does about taking care of myself, which somehow leads into the rest of my day. But um, yeah, I have a four and a six year old. So there's a very critical period of time in the morning where we can get up and out and fed and I can have time to make my coffee, which is sort of like my non-negotiable is like, I need to have enough time to make my coffee so that I can drink it on the way to dropping off said children at various schools. So my day gets started often in, in a rush. But I really enjoy that like 15 to 20 minute window. Kids are dropped off. I don't have to be anywhere yet. I can kind of just sit and be in my thoughts. Try not to be on my phone, but oftentimes I find that I am. So I would say it's a relaxing way to start the day, but it is the reality (laughs) of of being a a mom and a a business owner. It is what it is. So I imagine those those moments that are just strictly you time, that's uh, they're probably few and far between, but absolutely. Few and uh, far between, and they're often late at night (laughs) when (laughs) when everyone is asleep. I bet. Uh, Well, along those lines, do you have a favorite life hack? Is there anything that you do to make things maybe just a little bit easier when you're managing young children and and a a successful restaurant? So this is this is something that I think is easier said than done. But embracing a personal day, I think is really important. I love that. It's not something you can do all the time. And mm-hmm. if you have the luxury, that's that's also part of it. But like an impromptu, like, I just need a day and do whatever you want to do. It doesn't have to be structured. It doesn't have to be the laundry. It can be, and even if it is the laundry, that's okay too, if that's what makes you happy. But I think there's so much build up to taking time off that it's overwhelming. Yeah, because you're. I have to get all these things done, yeah. you know, and you you have all these expectations for what that time off is going to look like, and it often never, you know, it turns out that way. But like a last minute, like you know, I'm just not going to come in tomorrow. We'll figure it out. I'm going to do these other things, and I'll catch up, you know, the following day. I think really can hit the reset button and help you recharge your batteries. I get that. On those personal days, do, do you have a favorite book you like to read or anything that you like to check? I've in really with? gotten into audiobooks the, of the last year or two. I just finished listening to one that. I, was very important to me and I'm still still thinking about, which was the memoir by Ina Garten. 
when the be ready when the luck happens. Oh, Just nice. finish it. it. I literally started it the day they came out and uh, <laughs> read it in three days or oh, listened nice. to it in three days. And she was someone who was very influential in like the formative years of me getting into this industry when I was not in this industry at all. And I was in a completely different career in a different state, learning how to cook as a 20 something. And she taught me and listening to her story and how she became the successful person that she is was just like just the right thing that I needed to listen to right now. I love that. I've recently started. This is a slight departure, but somewhat related. I, I feel like I have the right person to ask. Are there any cookbooks you like around the house? Anything you would recommend? So many cookbooks. In fact, Prime Day was really dangerous <laughs> for me. I just bought a several more cookbooks. <laughs> um, I picked up a beautiful book on pasta by the chef Missy Robbins out of New York. It is like a complete ultimate guide to every shape, every dough, every preparation. In fact, the last two nights as a family, we have been making fresh pasta with the kids, ravioli, fettuccine. It's been amazing. Oh, so wow. it's really kind of sparked a, a thing amongst our, our kids, which has been fantastic. Oh, that's so fun. There's yeah. more collaborative you know, meals that you can make. That's, yeah, that's awesome. yeah. It's a little hands-on, a little dangerous with the pasta <laughs> machine, but you know what? They, they, they mostly listened. <laughs> I love that. That's great. Well, along the lines of food, uh, beyond your restaurants, do you have a favorite restaurant here in St. Louis where you might like to take the fat? Family or might like to take someone who's in from out of town. Yeah, I mean, so much of our dining out, you know, not to keep talking about my children, but revolves around what, you know, you can do as yeah. opposed to date nights per se. But we live in Webster Grove, so we love to support Ono Pizza. Oh, yeah. It's one of our favorite spots, you know, for even just to grab a drink for happy hour or, you know, to take the kids or to have a secret late night date night, which we sometimes do after <laughs> uh, we get off just a little bit early from, from work. We Kind of my husband, Michael, and I will meet up at the bar and, you know, grab a pizza to take home before after a long Saturday. Oh, I bet. That's yeah, awesome. But I would say there, I just, another favorite of ours is Union Loafers, mm-hmm. really anything in the Loafers family. Yeah. I live around the corner from Bagel, Bagel Union. So those are, those are really popular ones for our family as well. That's great. There's so many great places. There is. I, I could tell you 75 million places, oh. but you know, the reality is we probably go to five places over and over again because it makes everybody happy. That's, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> And they make you feel good. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we try to do as well. Whoever, you know, I feel like thinks that way about us is an incredible honor because it means a lot when you are, you know, spending your hard-earned money at a place and that you feel like you can keep going back because they take really great care of you. And no matter how loud you might be. <laughs> I swear, whenever I go to your restaurants, I'm not loud, but I am enjoying myself every single time. You guys do such a great job at your properties. It's, well, it's awesome to Thank stop you. in and get a great meal. The team's incredible. Yeah, they really are. Every, every single place, it's, it's just a great experience every single time. Well, let's talk more about it. Let's dive in. I mentioned at the top how Take Root Hospitality is no stranger to national acclaim from the James Beard Award to shout outs and all sorts of major publications. Uh, you and the rest of the team have clearly created some concepts that really resonate with diners in St. Louis and beyond. But how'd you get to this point? Can you just sort of retrace the origins of Take Root and share with us how you got to this point here in St. Louis? Yeah, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a journey, a little <laughs> bit of a winding path. Yeah, as I alluded to, I, I am not from St. Louis. I am originally from South Florida, actually. I went to college for journalism at Central Florida and had a whole other life I thought I was going to live and, you know, tried out a few different corporate jobs. I worked in HR sort of by accident and realized after a few years of that experience that I was just not this was not the passion that I had planned. And I started as a hobby cooking, watching cooking shows. As I mentioned, Ina Garden was a big influence for me. It was very much of the time of Julie and Julia, you know, that all of that was was very popular. I started a food blog back when I was 24 years old. Oh, wow. You know, and I really just found that at work I was thinking about right. I was thinking about what I was going to make for dinner, what I was going to plan for the weekend, what I was going to share on this blog that 10 people read, mostly my family. <laughs> and at, at some point I decided, you know, my priorities are not in alignment. I'm going to take a risk. I was 25 years old. I could, I could do it at the time. And I quit and I went to apply to culinary school in New York City. I had a best friend from childhood that lived in the city. And I thought, well, I know somebody there. And if this doesn't work out, it's a year and I can come home and start over. But yeah, I, I sort of just went and said, I'll figure it out. Fell in love with New York City. Fell in love with cooking professionally, or at least learning to. I got to go to the French Culinary Institute, which was just an incredible, incredible school and met all the right people, said yes to every opportunity, didn't make any money for a while, <laughs> but just kept volunteering and putting myself out there and kind of led me to a few other interesting jobs and worked at the Food Network. I worked for some food magazines and I ended up ultimately getting an apprenticeship at this restaurant called Blue Hill at Stone Barnes, which is 
just outside New York City in Westchester County. And it's an incredible world class, you know, one of the best restaurants in the world run by Chef Dan Barber. And I got to do an apprenticeship where I worked on the farm because it was on a working farm, the Stone Barn Center, for one day a week and four days a week, I worked in the restaurant and I learned the front of house, which I did not know. I had been learning cooking at that point, but I didn't sure. understand service. Uh, didn't even really know if that's what I wanted to do, but I thought I just wanted to be at this place. Right. It is truly, if you've ever been there, um, you know what I'm talking about, but if you haven't, it is a magical, picturesque, like bucolic, just incredible farm restaurant and a place to learn, quite honestly. So I got to be there immersed in this really special place. And at a time when that restaurant was really evolving and changing and getting a really um, global audience. And I ended up meeting uh, the chef there, um, who I swore I would never, never date anybody uh, <laughs> that I worked with, let alone a chef, which yeah. came with all kinds of connotations, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I met my husband, Michael. He was the chef de cuisine there. And um, we uh, dated for a while and you know, ended up uh, deciding to get married. After we did, we kind of made the the leap that it was time to to move on and maybe give something a chance on our own. Michael is from St. Louis, which is what brought us here. And ultimately, it was just to check it out. I mean, we weren't even like, let's go open a restaurant in St. Louis. Let's go somewhere sure. and start. So we came, we moved in with his mom. And, you know, I mean, it was it was a change of lifestyle, especially leaving New York. But we thought, let's just get to know people. Let's do some pop-up dinners. This was when pop-up dinners were becoming, yeah. you know, a thing. And let's just see what the community thinks of us and, you know, what what opportunities might exist. And it was really organic and we didn't have a master plan. And sure enough, we just kind of kept getting opportunities to do different events. And we kept saying yes. And then the opportunity to open a restaurant became a reality, um, which is Visia. Um, and as we worked towards opening, we just really spent a lot of time getting to know the St. Louis community from the agriculture side, from who we were going to be buying from, farmers, the other chefs in, in the area, which, you know, is still something I very much believe today is which make St. Louis special is just how collaborative it is and how open people are to new voices coming into the picture and wanting to help you. And it was really like coming from a place like New York where that is just, I mean, that's just not how it is. It's, sure. it's, it's a much different environment. It was a little like, whoa, is this real? And, you know, it really helped us grow in a big way. That's so interesting. And, and I imagine that was a really interesting process to go through. I mean, I, I was curious how this all started here in St. Louis. It's interesting to know that Michael has, you know, his background is here. He's from here. But during that process, when you're doing those pop-ups, when you're learning this community, learning this market from a restaurant perspective, what, what did you learn? What were some of those things you learned initially about that, that maybe informed your journey as, as, a, as a restaurant group? Yeah, I mean, I think it was really grassroots marketing, essentially, because we got to invite these strangers essentially to come eat our food in a, a, a unfamiliar place maybe and get to know us in a way that we could really connect with them in a, in a way that as you are running a restaurant day to day is just too challenging sure. right so we got to kind of build and we would notice each dinner we would see the same people coming and they would bring a different friend and it was like this we were kind of like building this little crew and it was incredible and I didn't we I think we did 20 of these dinners in between start and finish which was a lot longer than we had planned, but <laughs> opening a restaurant usually takes a lot longer of than you course. think it's going to. But we got to learn, I think, what St. Louis as a dining culture was really all about. And insert the cuisine here, but I think it's really about supporting small independent businesses. And that's not just food. I mean, I feel like that's so many different facets of the um, the marketplace here, but people really want to support local. They want to see you succeed um, in a way that I think makes it unique to open a business in a place like St. Louis. But um, we got to know them. And even before we moved to St. Louis, we actually took a meeting with Danny Meyer, who was, you know, claimed restaurateur from St. Louis. Yeah. We got to steal 30 minutes of his time. And the one piece of advice that he gave us that, you know, I still, I still think about was got to get, get to know them, let them fall in love with you, and then you can do whatever you want basically what he said. And so I've always kind of thought about that. And and the original opening of Visia was a, I don't want to call it controversial, it wasn't controversial, but the kind of cuisine we were doing was different, right? It was, yeah. we would call it vegetable forward, use the word farm to table, whatever you want. You know, that that wasn't new, but I think the way we were focusing vegetables was was different. And in the beginning was not for everybody. And we were still trying to figure out what people wanted from us. And a real, I'll, I'll mention this because I think it's funny now, but at the time, We'd been open, I don't know, a few months. And the editor of the editorial page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch wrote an editorial about our restaurant and how it was basically everything that was wrong with America. 
And it was it was for a minute there really like felt like the worst thing that had ever happened to us. It was really hurtful. And I was like, this could do us in. Like, you know, this could be it for us. And the complete opposite happened. And the amount of people that reached out to us in support and were like, you know, this guy, like, don't listen to him. We love what you're doing. Keep, you know, keep pushing. You know, we'll keep coming back. And that was like, you know, really, really, really meant a lot. Yeah, I bet. And, and it, it, I was going to ask you something along those lines that, you know, we're sitting here in the, the land of gooey butter cake and toasted <laughs> ravioli. And sure. I, I'm curious, it's how do you how did you feel? How confident were you that a concept like Visia would would catch on and resonate with diners here? I mean, what what made you want to pursue that and feel like we have a lane here? We think we can do this right. Let's do it. What made you confident in going that approach? I think we, I think in our hearts, we knew we had come from a place where we learned such wonderful, you know, knowledge and and skills and tools to how to translate that and carbon copy and pick up this incredible restaurant we worked at in New York and move it to St. Louis. It was never going to be that, right? But I think to be able to take the spirit of that translated into an experience St. Louis would appreciate um, was the goal. And I, I think we felt confident we could get we we could do that and it would succeed at some point and it was i think we had a lot of confidence and maybe just naivete in the beginning too they were like we're just going to do this and you know if we fail we fail and you know we'll figure out the next move and so i kind of think we were just so overwhelmed <laughs> and so in the weeds with all of it that we just kept going and didn't really stop to think too much about like are people going to like this you know i think i think about that a lot more now than i did that for sure sure, sure. I, you know, I, I've mentioned on this podcast before, I'm, I'm a transplant. I'm not from here. I Where are you here. from? I'm from Baltimore. Okay. Moved here. My wife's a professor at WashU, so we moved here for her career. Gotcha. And actually, one of our first meals in St. Louis was at Visia, and that was that. one of my introductions to the restaurant scene here. And over the last five years, I've been so pleasantly surprised at how awesome the restaurants here are. We have such an amazing dining scene, and it probably goes without saying, anyone who's spent any amount of time here in St. Louis probably has a, a similar uh, affinity for all the restaurants we have here. It's a great place to Absolutely. go out to eat. Why is that? Why do we have so many awesome concepts? Is it is it just the, the is it the cost of doing business here allows you to take big swings and try things that might be a little bit more prohibitive in other larger markets? I mean, what is is there a secret sauce here that that just allows? I think there is a secret sauce. I mean, I think that's a big piece of it, right? right. I mean, I think you, as I mentioned earlier, like there's just this uh, uh, warm embrace of we want to try the new place, which is a bit of a catch twenty two sometimes because sure. there are so many fun new things all the time that oh, it yeah. can feel a bit like you're left, you know, for the new shiny toy. So it's a tricky, it's a <laughs> tricky line to, you know, to walk. But I think by and large, people love to to support something local and, and unique, right? So that's part of it. I think the cost of doing business, definitely, or at least going back to, you know, we've almost been open at Vista eight years now. So, you know, te- a decade ago when we were really working on this, oh my gosh, yes. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if I would compare it the same today in the economics of, sure. of the current state of the world, but I think a decade ago, it, made all kinds of sense. I mean, we would have need we would have needed a million investors to even attempt to open something in New York or even Florida where I'm from. I mean, it just would have been crazy, right? Yeah. So I think there's that. And I think there's a lot of interesting people that are from here that go out and have all these other really cool experiences across the world, not even just in the country, and then decide at some point, whether it's family reasons or economic reasons, I want to I want to go back home, you know, and share what I've learned. And I think there's a lot of pride and people from St. Louis wanting to do that when they feel like they're ready to do it. So I, I think those three things kind of make a really unique mix. Plus, you mentioned WashU, but I think the educational community that we have here that move here for the universities, um, whether it's students or faculty, are also hugely interesting people that constantly want, you know, to have those experiences that maybe they'd say they're used to on the coast, right? Yeah. But have those here in that makes sense. Well, we're all better for it, for, for I think so. taking yeah, all these chances sure. and, and opening all these places. It's, it's such a tough industry. It's such, such a tough business, but you are clearly doing a great job. You're, you're hitting all the right notes. It seems we're trying. so many places. It feels well, impossible. It feels impossible a lot oh, of the I time, if, I, if I'm being honest, but, but we're certainly trying really hard. Well, one thing that's really interesting me, to, to me about Take Root is that obviously the, the sit down dining experience is, is really fun and really unique across all of your properties, but you're also expanding and, and doing more with catering and private events. How do you grow that side of the business? What, what, what other factors do you consider as you try to you know, branch out beyond just the sit down component of dining? Yeah, I mean, I think if the pandemic taught us anything is you got to diversify, right? You've got to come up with some other ways to, to continue revenue streams. If it's a slow month, you know, what else can you be doing? 
and you have to meet people where they are. And I think as it comes to catering, you know, I, I feel like we were maybe a little late to this game, but I think we wanted to feel ultimately like we were very ready to support it in a quality way, because that's for us, uh, you know, a really important principle is the sure. product that we're delivering is, is really high quality. So getting into catering and being able to bring box lunches, being able to bring taco bars, let's say from Taqueria Marita, or, you know, be able to cater, you know, baby showers at people's houses from Winslow's Table. Like we have opportunities to meet people with a really quality product, but in an environment that for whatever reason, whether it's budget or location makes sense for them. And so I think growing the catering side has become for me personally, something I've spent a better part of the last six months of my day to day has been working with our team on like, how do we grow this part of our business? Marketing is part of it, which, you know, and then what resources do you invest to do that and, and risks that you take and see where it pays off, right? So we're constantly thinking of new promotions, new personal contacts that we can sort of reach out to more intimately to try to get them to support that side of the business and then spread the word. So there's that piece, in-house marketing, emails. I mean, it's it's all of it. Um, but I think that's really important. And the private events thing as well is something I think we do exceedingly well, which is, you know, geared towards everything from corporate dinners, which, you know, we can do from small to large at Vicia in a really beautiful way. We do a lot of wedding related events too, from showers to rehearsal dinners to, you know, wet full blown weddings. We have one in two weeks at Vicia, oh, awesome. which is coming up and is quite the production. And I have a big, yeah, big meeting about that tomorrow. And, you know, we're excited. We don't do them constantly because they take up a lot of energy and, you know, they're expensive to produce, but, but they can be really very special. And I think we can provide people that are looking for events that really focus on the food and hospitality much more than just your average venue can provide. You mentioned this has taken up so much of your time the last few months and, and figuring out how to grow this and, and expand and diversify a little bit. What have you learned from this process? Is, are there any sort of lessons that have come up as you've dived into this and, and figured out this is an area we can grow, this is an area we can expand? What have you learned? Yeah, I mean, I've learned that it's necessary, whether, you know, you want to, you think you want to do events and catering or not, you really have to, you know, and it's a great way to leverage your brand and get more audience that maybe live in Chesterfield or wherever and would not be coming into your restaurant because it's not in their neighborhood. Sure. But they go to an event where they have a beautiful platter of cookies from Winslow's table, like this box I've shared with you here <laughs> in right. the center of the table, Mike. Pretty and they're like, oh my God, this this Winslow's bar, where did this come from? I need to have this, right? And so it's a really intimate, unique way to connect with a diner or a future guest because they have a flavor memory of something, right? So I think I've learned that you've got to, you've got to look at each opportunity as a way to market to new people. It's not just about the one client that you book booked through. It's about who is coming to that event and how can you reach them and grow your business to reach them in the future. So I've learned that much for sure. And I think just being willing to be creative and to say yes a lot. People have a lot of ideas and they don't always work out, right, with what you can provide, but I think you have to be open. Well, speaking of strategies, I, I thought you guys made a really interesting strategic decision at, at Visia earlier this year in you used to have the prefix menu, you transitioned to a la carte. What are some of the factors you all weigh when you make a decision like this that really sort of changes the whole fundamental understanding of a restaurant? When someone goes to this restaurant, they say, okay, we're going to get the farmer's feast. We're going to go here. We're going to, we were expecting this, but now it's totally different. What are the factors you weigh when you, when you consider a pivot like that? Yeah, I think I think looking back now, this was probably one of the biggest business decisions that we've really made. Mm. And it took a while to get there because we first, after we came out of the pandemic, we decided to go all in on this prefix experience only. And some of that was driven by limited resources, you know, challenging with staffing and the amount of people you could have in the restaurant at a time and, you know, spaced out tables, et cetera. You know, so it was like, what can we do to get the same amount of revenue, but with less people? And people were really jazzed about having an experience at that time. And so that's kind of where that was born from. And we loved the idea of being able to just let you sit back and not have to think about a thing, right? It right. helped us control costs, food costs, especially because you weren't ordering anything. So we didn't waste anything. It was really strategic from that end. It was unique. It was a value, in my opinion. It was something we really kind of, I think, underpriced for a long time, but it, we'd never wanted to be too expensive, right? Because, you know, then you kind of price yourself out. And people loved it. But as I started, you know, over the last year, you know, the the numbers just weren't the same. We weren't seeing as many people. Economics is certainly part of that. And how people are utilizing their disposable income has changed significantly. And, you know, the types of experiences people want to have, I think, are leaning more back towards comfort and 
you know, connection as opposed to high end. The pendulum has sort of swung back in the other direction. And so I kind of saw this happening, you know, and was like, I don't want to overreact, right? Let's not just change the menu because we have a feeling right now. Let's let's feel this out and see. And I think I, you know, came to the conclusion that like, if we don't, if we don't make this change, I, I don't know that we can be successful long term because, you know, we're doing, there's just diminishing <laughs> returns sure. on less covers, right? So we made the move to switch back to an a la carte menu, which was a big shift internally, even though it sounds pretty simple, but it really did change a lot of our process and how we do things. But it was like, how can we do more people? They might spend less, right? Our check average might go down, but we ultimately want to do more people. We want to be busy on a Tuesday. You know, I don't want to do 15 people on a Tuesday. I want to do a tasty menu. I want to do 50 people that just want to come in and grab dinner. Right. And so that's kind of how it started. And now we offer essentially a hybrid experience, which I think we're in the sweet spot that is working, which is fully a la carte. You can have whatever you want. There's no rules. But we also, if you want, offer this cook for you experience, which is a little bit of a scaled back version of that farmer's feast that pulls from the menu, but lets you not make any choices. And people are really loving it. And so you can come for either. It isn't this, I can't eat at this yet because I don't want to spend $350. Sure. It's not, I really wanted to move away from that. So that experience is not a barrier to entry anymore. That's interesting. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. It, it, I, I love going to Vicio. Obviously, the food is great. The, the ambiance is awesome too. It, it's also in a really interesting area in the city. It's nestled right into Cortex. Taqueria Marita is right across the parking lot, essentially. It, it's a really interesting dynamic you have there. How much do those two properties just feed off of that area there, right in that Cortex district? Yeah, internally, we call it our campus, right? Yeah, like sure. we've got, now that we've got both restaurants, like we share this parking lot and you'll just, if you go by any point in the day, you'll see like a chef pushing a rolling <laughs> cart back and forth. They're sharing equipment, you know? So like, it's a real symbiosis between the two restaurants, yeah. which is awesome. And, you know, the taqueria was born out of this sort of pop-up outdoor experience that we did for two years and, and found that people really loved. And so this opportunity... It came about to move in adjacent to the Aloft Hotel, and it just felt like a great way to continue on what we've already started, but in something more sustainable that has a roof and can be climate controlled, <laughs> given the weather conditions. You can have a whole separate interview about running an outdoor restaurant. Oh, but, gosh. But yeah, Cortex, I mean, we, so it's been, you know, we started talking to them in 20, early 2016. And, you know, coming up with this idea of putting Vicia, which we knew would be a bit of a destination restaurant by taking a risk and going in that community. But it was really built on innovation. It was built on having unique individuals sort of like collaborating on ideas. And that really much fell in line with the brand we were trying to create with Vicia at the time. And so it's been it's been neat to watch that sort of evolve and morph around each other. There are a lot of unique businesses down there that I think draw in our ideal our ideal customer, which is it's a huge advantage for us. And I think we can also bring people down there that just are coming to dinner to be like, what's what's this Cortex about? You know, yeah. which I think for them helps to sort of bring new sets of fresh eyes to the community. And I think, you know, they're still very much trying to sort of figure out their post-pandemic pivot as well. And so we're sort of working, working on that together of how we can get more folks to want to come down and experience that area. But sure. I think the spirit of collaboration is still there. And I think the opportunity to just be innovative is something that inspires us and I, I think makes sense in that neighborhood. I, I thought that was a really interesting point about just bringing people into that particular neighborhood. I mean, from my perspective, like I said, Missia was one of my favorite or one of my first places, one of my favorites, but also one of the first places I tried. I'm probably not going to Cortex very yeah. often unless I'm going to one of your restaurants. So I think it's, it gave me an interesting perspective as a new St. Louisan to go and see this particular neighborhood, see all the, the cool innovation that is happening here. I wouldn't be there without the hospitality aspect that, that take root. Yeah, so we're definitely, you know, work together. And I think there's so much about St. Louis that is special because of neighborhoods like that, you know, and you think about, you know, the Del Mar as well and like all of these projects that are really trying to transform neighborhoods into yeah. hubs of, mm -hmm. of real creativity. And so I think this is, this is a perfect example of that. Well, we're almost to the end of the year where I have 2025 on the mind already as we Me start too. planning all I bet, <laughs> start planning all these sorts of different publications and projects. As you look to the new year and even years to come, are there any industry trends you're following that might be especially relevant in 2025 as, as a restaurateur? Are there any things that you're keeping an eye on, keeping your finger on the pulse for as we get into the new year? I think more hands-on experiences. I continue to see not just in this market, but, you know, across the country of people wanting to find different types of ways to connect with a restaurant, whether that's a hands-on cooking class, or, you know, or some type of demonstration or um, workshop or some reason to get you into the building to 
do something creative and get a more in-depth experience, get to know the chefs, get to know the creators, the bartenders, what have you. I've seen a lot more of that. And I think that's something we have really been working on even in the last few months to sort of focus on events and not like you planning a party at my restaurant, but us curating events for people to attend. Experience. Um, experiences. Yeah. So I would say in conjunction with really pushing this catering and events line of our business, we've in-house event planning has also been a big driver for us. And that could be everything from, you know, a wine tasting with a, a winemaker coming into town that you could kind of get a unique experience to get to know. Just this past weekend, we threw a Filipino pig roast outside of Visia with one of our, our head chefs is from the Philippines, Chef Jane, and it was incredible. And it was just something totally different. And, you know, not what we do every day. You know, we're doing a fall festival at Winslow's table next week with, you know, different outside vendors and, you know, kids cookie decorating, you know, just finding different ways to connect with our guests, to get them to come back, that is outside of just, you know, come order the thing you always order and, you know, or go on a date type, but like have a different kind of experience. So I, I think that is definitely something people are doing more of that I look to as well. That's awesome. Well, my eyes will be peeled for the next experiential event at one of your restaurants. I always love coming by with my wife and, and getting a great meal. Tara, thank you so much for coming and sharing thank some you. insights. Yeah. Appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. We'll be right back. Join the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra for a celebration of Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart during two weekends of captivating concerts. Catch the magic on November 9th and 10th at the Stiefel Theater and November 15th and 16th at Umsel's Tool Performing Arts Center. Each performance offers a unique glimpse into the life and legacy of one of classical music's greatest composers. Get tickets now at slso.org. Thanks again to Tara Galina for stopping by to chat today. Like I said at the top of the show, there's so many awesome restaurants to try in the St. Louis region. And without a doubt, Take Roots restaurants are genuinely some of my favorite concepts in town. And don't forget, for more on the local dining scene, be sure to check out our dining podcast, Arch Eats, which covers everything you could possibly want to know about food, drinks, and hospitality in St. Louis. That'll do it for this episode of the Biz STL podcast. Please don't forget to hit that subscribe button and share this episode with your friends, family, and colleagues. Stay connected with us by subscribing to our Biz STL leadership newsletter at stlmag.com slash newsletters and follow along on Instagram at St. Louis Mag. If you loved what you heard, show us some love by rating and reviewing us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you choose to listen. We appreciate your support and can't wait to have you join us again. Until next time, I'm Mike Miller.